Hi, my name is Shanspeer, your new best friend. I like reading, writing, and putting on a show, but my favorite thing to be is yours. I was invented for you. Every plastic breath I take is for you. You can dress me up however you like. You can choose the words I say and how I say them. You can berate me and yell at me and call me worthless. You can do my hair and pinch my cheeks. I'll never get tired. I'll never grow obsolete. I'll never get tired of lacking agency. I am a mangled Barbie doll trapped in its box, living out an exhibitionist fantasy, but I am not alone. There are hundreds more like me. Thousands. Millions of us, you see. We're all animals trapped in our cages, predestined to spend eternity chewing off the wrong leg, the leg unchained. We never grow tired on this conveyor belt of performance. We never run out of space for more eyes. Our rooms never feel too small when filled with our audiences. We never get t tired of being yours. I was invented for you. Every beat of my plastic heart is for you. My name is Shanspeer, and I am your very best thing. In January 1818, Mary Shelley published what was to become the greatest gothic horror story of all time. Frankenstein started as a short story spurred on by a bet because talented people are annoying and they can spawn monumental pieces of artwork at the drop of a hat, I guess. Imagine you make a silly bet with your friends while you're vacationing in Geneva, Switzerland of all places, and one of you writes the vampire and another writes fucking Frankenstein. God, I am so talentless and alone. Which is, funnily enough, exactly what Victor Frankenstein was thinking approximately 12 hours before making the greatest mistake of his life. Frankenstein the novel follows a young scientist named Frankenstein the person, who is currently in shambles over the death of his mother. Which is totally valid, by the way. <laughs> but instead of going to therapy or talking to a friend to deal with these tough emotions, Victor does something that this current generation hasn't seen in a gothic brooding hero since Twilight. Victor throws himself into his studies to deal with his overwhelming grief and finds that he's actually quite good at science. Chemistry, to be exact. And through some indeterminate means that we probably shouldn't gloss over but do, Victor realizes that he can give living qualities to non-living things. He can literally impart life onto beings, which is kind of a big deal for all of us who aren't, like, Beyonce. Most scholars think that in order to make his creature, Victor raided graveyards for various body parts, sewed them together, and got a brain from the college to put in the creature's skull. Meaning that the creature is three seconds alive and already has a better college education than I do with none of the debt. Fucking nepotism, babies. The interesting thing about the creature is that he's created to be beautiful. Victor ensures this by painstakingly choosing each feature. He gives the creature lustrous black hair that flows down his neck and pearly white teeth that shine in his mouth. But upon animating him, Victor notices that the creature is an uggo. His eyes are watery and unnaturally white, his complexion is shriveled, and his lips are black. The creature stands at a whopping eight feet, and everything about him is proportioned to fit this size. He's like Shaq with less riz. <laughs> Needless to say, everyone is terrified by this creature, but none are more terrified than Victor. In fact, he hates the creature. It's destructive and hideous, and it threatens the very lifeblood of his friends and family. He wishes to abandon it. He wishes to kill it. But the creature absorbs every inch of Victor's life until there's nothing left. He kills Victor's brother, his brother's nanny by proxy, Victor's best friend, Victor's wife. Even when we speak of Frankenstein, we 
erroneously attribute that name to the creature, giving little thought to the actual person behind the monster. There's a metaphor coming. <laughs> Victor Frankenstein's dilemma is not unlike the dilemma facing celebrities today. Most of them create intentionally beautiful public personas, their very own creatures, who end up becoming hideous shadows that are cast over the celebrity's personal identity. One major example of this phenomenon would be the dichotomy between Lady Gaga and Stephanie Germanotta. Gaga sat down with CBS Sunday Morning host Lee Cohen in 2016 and 2020. Lee is one of those unfortunate souls who look a lot like Tucker Carlson, with the only grand difference between Lee and Tucker being that Lee still has his job. In the 2016 interview, Gaga speaks about dividing herself into two different individuals. The godlike being she encapsulates on stage, made up of vibrant wigs and eccentric costumes, and the version of her that has grown and evolved privately for the past 36 years. Lady Gaga, the persona, is hard to shake off for Stephanie Germanotta, the person. She likens it to being unable to wash Gaga off after a performance. When she goes home, when she's with her family, she's still metaphorically wearing those precariously styled wigs, still wrapped in the fragile fabric of her costumes. It's gotten to the point where Stephanie expresses a sort of hatred for Lady Gaga. Stephanie's the young Victor Frankenstein, beholding his hideous creature and deciding that he made a mistake. He played God, a little too well. It's like the infamous meat dress has been stapled to Stephanie's body since wearing it. It grows more putrid and abhorrent as time goes on, but she can't find the goddamn zipper. Eventually, the dress will completely entomb her, as the creature did with Frankenstein's life. It'll get harder and harder to discern between the two women. You know what's funny and completely unrelated yet parallel to this discussion? <laughs> they preserved Lady Gaga's meat dress. It's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame looking like a two pixel flesh prison from Silent Hill 1999. It has less dimension than Laura Croft's chest in 1996. Nothing that looks like that is absorbing anything. There's not enough dimension. <laughs> Lady Gaga isn't the only celebrity disenchanted with the monster she made. Celebrities in every faction of the industry, celebrities all over the world, are jumping at the opportunity to tell you that they're miserable. And I don't say that with the condescension of denying these claims or even with the naivety of saying celebrities don't have good reason to feel this way. I say it with an alert understanding of just how desperate celebrities are to reveal this information. This confession is vital. It's fundamental for us as an audience to see them as performers and go, wait, no, that's not right. Celebrities aren't performers. I should say celebrities aren't just performers. They're people. People who seem to have been called into a slaughterhouse stocked with microphones and cameras, whose every move is recorded, analyzed, and replayed to the masses. Secret moments, private flings, even their breakdowns and cries for help are cut, cast, and directed. Money can't buy you reprieve from this. Status only encourages it. Celebrities are trapped the moment they become recognizable. In a 2014 short film titled Yours and Mine, Beyonce states, when you're famous, no one looks at you as a human anymore. You become the property of the public. Celebrities sit at an intersection of real and not real, of human and manufactured creature. And yet, even through this objectification, they're everything we want to be. Beautiful, rich, adored. All throughout history, we've begged for these characteristics. If we have to live a life without fame, we might as well not live it at all. Such were the thoughts of Mary McLean in her 1902 novel, The Story of Mary McLean. McLean was a Canadian-American writer with a rich and oftentimes controversial history. Her first book, The Story of Mary McLean, was thought to be a danger to vulnerable minds. Her and her LGBT nature would corrupt the world and convert our youth. She'd make thieves and spinsters out of our children. Or worse, they'd desire the touch of another woman. The New Yorker even wrote in 1902 that Mary McLean is mad. She should be put under medical treatment and pens and paper kept out of her way until she is restored to reason. Within her controversial novel, McLean beckons to whom she calls the kind devil. She wants him to sweep her out of Montana, as I'm sure everyone in Montana can sympathize with, and send her on a whirlwind adventure through life. This adventure, she argues, was only possible by achieving fame and notoriety. I wish to acquire that beautiful, benign, gentle, satisfying thing, fame. 
I want it. Oh, I want it. I wish to leave all my obscurity, my misery, my weary unhappiness behind me forever. Mary McLean isn't alone in these ramblings. Over a century later, through old mediums and new ones alike, we too covet fame. Emily M. Danforth wrote an entire 600 page novel about it, how desperate some people are to obtain fame and how in ironic and fatal ways, fame can change us. Yes, I introduced Danforth's book with a page number just so you know, I read a book that's longer than an article. Yes, I'm just as surprised as you that a YouTuber knows how to read. No matter how much you think YouTubers don't read, YouTube commenters read far less. Even among average people, the desire to produce our own famous creature persists. We post endlessly on social media, we hop on trends hoping to be recognized. When that kind devil comes forth and bestows upon us our 15 minutes of fame, we're enthralled. We get in front of our cameras abashed and say, God, I didn't really expect this to blow up. Like, I literally just set my camera up while I was doing something quirky and funny, and I really didn't expect all of you to watch it. My mother once told me, meanwhile, I'm on the other side of the screen yelling at the top of my lungs for you to get to the point. And the point is explaining that small insignificant feature of your first post that ended up captivating the eyes and hearts of all 1.3 million of us viewers. Do you think I had the time to watch your two minute lead in about a chicken bake recipe your mom gave you when you were three years old and somehow allowed in the kitchen just so you can explain why you posted a video about a chicken with its head cut off driving a school bus? Get to the point. <clears throat> Sorry, that was the goldfish attention span talking. Do you still think I'm hot? If we were to look at a scale that had fame on one side and its inherent horrors on the other, it would look a lot more balanced than maybe we're comfortable with admitting. I mean, would you give up your privacy for a chance to be well known? Would you give up your agency to make lots of money? Would you give up your safety to be admired? And you know, when you think of all the answers to these questions, don't think about your thousands of dollars of student loan debt or your desire to buy a house or even the fact that you have to work yourself to the bone for the rest of your life and if you die on the job, they'll just replace your body before it gets cold. <laughs> By these accounts, fame is like a vibrant Matisse that has been superimposed over the most horrific of Goya's paintings. On the surface, there is happiness, glitz, and glamour. But if you reach forward and scratch at the cracked paint, Saturn's frenzied eyes look back at you, his mouth full of a bloody limb, his expression almost afraid. What if I told you that this is you? that we're all on a crash course headed straight for the inevitable horrors of celebrity culture. That you and Beyonce and Lady Gaga have more in common than you think, and for all the wrong reasons. What if I told you that celebrities aren't people, and neither are you? In February, I posted an informal part one to a series. A series that was supposed to be done in March, I know, but I am fighting for my fucking life right now. <laughs> Regardless, I posed a question in February. How does capitalism turn people into products? We began by tracing the descent of our beauty sick culture right into the arms of consumerism. Beauty giants, social media, and centuries of conditioning led us to place dystopian levels of importance on our beauty, effectively turning us into the very products we are told to buy. We made a brief pit stop at the intersection of aesthetic niches and doomed subreddits with our not serious analysis of fem cells, riot girls, and transgressive girlhood. And now we're here, dearest viewer, at the heart of this research, that of the watched and unwatched life of celebrities, influencers, and everyday internet users alike. How do we arrive at such a lifestyle of performance and fear? How does a mixture of capitalism, ego, incentive, and indoctrination kill the self and leave out the corpse of authenticity, where we are forever stuck in mediocre performance, forever trapped in the smudged lens of a recording camera. We will do our best to be nuanced as always, but remember, the purpose of an essay is not the answers itself, but more so the journey of getting to those answers. Just because I'm focusing my thesis on one of many points in this conversation doesn't mean that I intend to neglect or exclude. Fire off in the comments. That's why they're there. This is now the hour plus traffic of our stage. The witch, if you with patient ears attend, would here shall miss, my toil shall strive to mend.
You know, F. Scott Fitzgerald once wrote, So we beat on, bones against the current, born back ceaselessly into the past. It's a testament to how overwhelming history can be for us and for our future, no matter how hard we try to outrun it. The green light just outside of Gatsby's reach is simultaneously his past, present, and future crashing together. He has the girl, he's already lost the girl, and he never had the girl to begin with. It's a confusing mishmash of idealism and ambiguity. I'm going to try to make a clean segue here. <laughs> this contradictory existence is a lot like the history of celebrities. Did celebrities always exist or have they just sort of spawned in the last century? What makes a celebrity? Who qualifies and who doesn't? No scholar can agree. And it's making my life a lot goddamn harder. <laughs> the way I see it, you don't exist until corporations can sell you back to yourself. It was true of adolescents in the 1900s. It was true of teenagers back in the mid to late 40s and 50s. And I'm counting it as true even now in our discussion of celebrities. The reason we're so confused about when and where celebrities originated is because we're using synonymous yet alternative words when discussing them. Fame, honor, and glory are drastically different from our current understanding of celebrity. No matter what words you heard me use in the previous sections. I was so young back then. I've grown as a person. Being famous just means having a lot of eyes on you. You don't have to be well liked so much as you have to be well thought of. Renown, an oft used synonym of fame, is entirely different. When you're renowned, you're still well known, but there's also this implication of glory and eternal admiration. The way I see it, famous people have always existed, even if celebrities in the modern sense of the word didn't. If we're being technical, renowned people have always especially been here and are perhaps the closest thing we have to the modern connotations of celebrity. But their fame and fortune came about a lot differently than it would for a movie star or singer. Before the common era, philosophers and clerics were considered renowned for their insight and impression upon society. In ancient Greece, athletes were so famous that they were graced with poems and statues in their honor. Centuries later, death at the alleged hands of King Henry II made Thomas Becket so famous that he was canonized two years later and his body was moved to a crypt where visitors could leave kisses on the tomb. The communities of these famous people didn't herald them merely for their existence or art like we would today's celebrities, but instead for what they could do for the moral and prestigious health of their society. The main differences between historical ideas of fame and our current understanding of celebrity is not how many eyes are on you, but how those eyes find you in the first place. Greg Jenner defines celebrities as unique personas made widely known to the public via media coverage and whose lives are publicly consumed as dramatic entertainment. I would also add that celebrities are defined by the age of mass media, although various forms of media has existed for centuries before celebrities did, it was often confined to local communities or wealthier demographics. It wasn't until advancements in printing, railway systems, and physical duplication technologies came about that mass media really came into its own. It was made for wider audiences, faster communication, and an appetite for the inner workings of well-known people that minimized earlier forms of fame and glory. There's a sense of urgency to being a celebrity now that simply didn't exist for ancient Greek athletes. If they won the Olympics and brought home gold, or however the Olympics work, I'm too pretty for sports. <laughs> if they won the games, they brought honor to everything they touched forever. Their fame didn't depend on mass media relevance and consumerism the way modern celebrities do. It's a lifestyle that's simply not comparable to the Kardashians, who have built their celebrity status from mass media itself. Celebrities are modern inventions simply because of how we know them and how we sustain them. Ancient Greek athletes are forever remembered in poetry and on vases, but I don't think anyone, and I mean anyone, is doing that for like Charlie Sheen. I don't even think anyone remembers that that guy isn't dead. Everything we find out about celebrities, we find out the way God intended through clickable news headlines and leaked police reports parallel to contextless family guy clips. Oh, sweet. 
man-made horrors beyond my comprehension. <laughs> Remember when I said that you don't exist until brands try to sell you back to yourself? Industrialization ushered in faster ways for the world to make and take. Specifically in America, the food, clothing, and entertainment industries flourished. And this happened alongside businesses seeking new opportunities to enslave you. I mean, make money off of you. <laughs> I mean, give you fun things to do in your spare time. Accordingly, the modern celebrity came at a time when the West was clamoring for brands, not necessarily other people. Conversations of fame shifted from noblemen and war heroes to movie stars and basketball players. Gossip columns, previously known as society pages, became a sensation in the 1800s as newspapers covered the happenings and mishappenings of old and new money alike. Socialites began sponsoring products, celebrity weddings made national headlines, and somewhere along the way came flip phones tucked into waistbands, fire crotch jokes, and lots and lots of Coke. Uh, cola. Coca-Cola. Celebrities love Coca-Cola. How Freudian. To make a long matter short, audiences worldwide were becoming obsessed. As Mott et al. argue, society was at first aghast, then amused, then complacent, and finally hungry for the penny press stories of its own doings. The modern celebrity, at last, is born. So why do we hate this baby's guts? Where's the celebration, the off-kilter, slightly dangerous and bizarre gender reveal party? Did you know that when the creature was born, so to speak, in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Victor didn't shout, It's alive! Oh, it's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That was a creative liberty taken by James Well in 1931 when he adapted the novel for the big screen. In all actuality, Victor was terrified of his creation, terrified that his own two hands could make something so hideous. And this terror didn't come later in the book when Victor witnessed the horrors of his creature. It didn't take all of the murder of all those dear to him for Victor to be repulsed by this creature. It came immediately, as soon as he laid eyes on the creature's final form. I think society feels that way about celebrity culture sometimes. We're too disgusted, too afraid of what we've done that we can't possibly celebrate it. We made and neglected this monster. And now, the only difference standing between us and Victor is that we can't look away from what we've done. Welcome to another episode of Don't Show This to the Government, Please, I'm Begging You, where I, your host, Shan Spear, ruin my chances of ever getting a real adult job. Remember kids, digital footprints are only as real as you make them. Today, we will discuss what it takes to commit a murder. Not physically. God, what are you? Some type of weirdo? I'm talking raw, unadulterated, emotional manipulation and dehumanization. The works. <laughs> so in August of 2022, I posted a video essay about video essays. It was such a good video that it knocked my head right off. <laughs> I was on a roll. <laughs> Anyways, in that video, I talked about the plight of creating art as a black person in a society that, you know, may not like black people. Maybe. The jury's still out on that one, depending on if you ask a normal person or a person with a car selfie on Twitter. But I got an interesting comment on that video that I think pertains to the murder that's about to take place. It reads as follows. I love that you blew up, Shan. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but your audio quality is terrible. There are tons of tiny white bread tube channels that are also struggling because production values and scripting are a mess. You're producing a product. That product is part of the equation. Sharpen your knives. Okay, thank you for that lovely fan mail. I think at its core, this comment isn't wrong. Truthfully, my audio probably could use some TLC. I've been doing this for a little over two years and I don't have a background in video production. I was an English major after all, the worst kind of learner. And like they state, my job as a YouTuber is to produce videos for an audience in order to get paid. I'm creating products or content as the youth say. But at the same time, being compared to white people- <laughs> I'm joking. Don't ever compare my struggles to white people a day in your life, but I'm joking. The problem I have with this comment is that word, product. It's one of the only adjectives used in the entire comment to describe my work. You know, 
besides terrible. <laughs> and this is seemingly coming from someone who enjoys the art I make. That word choice makes me feel like a thing. Like I'm not even a person on the other side of the screen reading this message. You're addressing me directly and yet you speak to me as if you're shouting into the void. Of course, you could say I'm being sensitive here. There is truth to the idea that I'm merely a vessel of production, but that's not all I am. I don't view myself or my work as a product, at least not anymore. It's cold and it's alien and it contrasts heavily with the raging passion I feel for what I do. If all you can see when you look at me is a walking product, you don't really see me. You don't see me as an artist or a writer or even a person. And that, dearest viewer, is the first step to pulling off the perfect murder. Because when you can look at someone and only see them in relation to your own consumption habits, your own standards, you feel justified in talking to and treating them like a bug to be crushed underneath your shoe. This selfish consumerism and alienation is exactly what led Victor to be afraid of his own creation. It's what made him so violently neglect a being that he created that it became evil. The creature didn't serve Victor the way he expected it to. It didn't look the way he wanted. And so he critiqued and renounced and dehumanized. Like we continue to do centuries later, Victor committed a bloodless yet morally damning murder. This is the foundation of which we have built celebrity culture. When industrialization repaved the way our society produced and consumed, it also catalyzed our dependence upon capitalism. As a result, the movie stars and Hollywood socialites that graced our screens quickly metamorphosed into something alien. They weren't quite people because we didn't think of them as beings with full agency, but they weren't entirely inanimate as we got firsthand glimpses of their starkly imperfect and perfectly human misadventures. Matthew Thompson calls this strange amalgamation of person and property a human brand. Any well-known persona who is the subject of marketing communications efforts. This is similar to the other half of Greg Jenner's definition of celebrity, which categorizes celebrities as unique personas whose commercial brand is made profitable for those who exploit their popularity and perhaps also for themselves. One reason that people tend to dislike celebrities, especially influencers, is because they sit at this intersection of person and object due to their manufactured media presence. We tend to view them as uniquely configured robots capable of mimicking human speech patterns or demonic vessels who sold their souls for power. Just listen to these comments found under Rihanna's recent Vogue pictures of her and her baby. This is so blatantly evil and it's right in your faces. Brainwash and Hollywood Satanism at its finest. Put an end to it because the real ones are not for it. I don't even know if this is the real Rihanna or another media plant and they have the real one locked up somewhere. But girl, this is very satanic and just altogether distasteful. When Rihanna called her baby Fine, someone replied, Fine is sexually suggestive and weird. I'm not gonna lie, but you're part of that society so I can't expect you to function like a normal person. Mind you, the whole time, this is the picture in question. <laughs> you guys don't get it, you're missing the cultural impact. This is... Shellian. This is Byronic. This is a Shakespeare wet dream. Celebrities and influencers tend to scare us because their existence doesn't feel natural to us. It doesn't feel human. Even still, we can't help but admire them. And forgive me, I'm about to make a Twilight reference, but <laughs> it's like in Twilight where the vampires are simultaneously enthralling and off-putting. We're drawn to them even when every instinct in our body tells us to run. Celebrities confuse us. And one thing about a person behind a keyboard, baby, they get angry when they get confused. All of this misunderstanding and hatred and conspiracy panic surrounding celebrities only further serves to dehumanize them. Humanize. Humana, humana, hum. Quote, contemporary celebrity has been composed of two major, often competing narratives about the relationship between celebrity status and merit. In one, people become famous because of achievement, merit, talent, or special internal qualities, earning admiration and attention. They are cream at the top of a meritocracy. In the other, people become famous because they have been made so, artificially produced for mass consumption by a team of investors, publicists, makeup artists, magazine publishers, and the like. They are factory products. In the first, they are to be revered or vicariously consumed. In the second, 
to be disdained or consumed as objects of identification. The blend of parasocial love and violent abuse that celebrities receive, both from the media and from fans, is a unique balancing act. On one hand, celebrities are told only daily from millions of people how much they are adored. People cry when their favorite celebrity touches them or replies to them even when their favorite celebrity is in the same room as them. Fans devote their entire social lives to celebrities. They spend their money, time, and attention in hopes of one day being noticed. But fans also attempt to swarm their favorite celebrity. They touch without consent, leak without remorse, read tantalizing exposés with no regard to privacy. Celebrity struggles are lambasted in the headlines. Their addictions, breakups and failures are made fun of. Women in the public eye are slut-shamed, threatened, over-sexualized. They even narrowly escape life-threatening danger. The insults hurled at celebrities range from tepid to unhinged to violent to transcendent of humanity entirely. It says opening it all. to every hacky joke. <laughs> <laughs> so your mom, I know your mom was killed, right? But, but, but did there they? There you go. But That's that, what I'm getting to. I mean, I really want to get into that now. You know, I'm just talking about Ellie to Vegas, but uh, okay. yeah, it was, it was definitely rough. And, what night uh, is that on? It's on Tuesdays. At night. It's on Tuesdays, Tuesdays at night. <laughs> it's not the death slot. Hey, speaking of death. Even so, celebrities are expected to laugh it off again and again and again. They're expected to be overly accommodating. They need to smile always, sign posters always, take pictures always. Even when they're tired, even when they're depressed, even after someone they love just died, their reputation is ruined otherwise. They're harassed and accused of being ungrateful otherwise. They're swarmed anyways otherwise. Their bodies are constantly monitored and their attractiveness speculated about. Lies are made up about them when news cycles get slow enough. Brutal truths are exposed in a desperate attempt to gain attention. They are stuck in a cage with a camera and a shotgun. One wrong move and either trigger gets pulled. And yet this barely even scratches the surface. The relationship we have with celebrities is a unique give and take system. They give us entertainment, willingly at first, and we take the parts of them that best serve our appetite. Oftentimes, we're not satiated by their music or their movies. We want to know what happens when that camera stops rolling, when they close the curtains to their estate, when they think that no one's listening anymore. We want to know who they've kissed, who they have had sex with, who they have yelled at, and who they have fired. We want to know the most intimate details of their life, as if they were casted in a reality TV show. Their torture is what entertains us the most. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> I'm defending multimillionaires from a few mean words. I'm a sellout. I mean, there are far greater issues happening in the world than some rich person getting their feelings hurt. And maybe you're right. After all, this is an entertainment channel on YouTube and not CNN. But truthfully, celebrities aren't the most persecuted people in the world. Most of them have never had to know what it's like to choose between electricity and dinner. Their money and their status almost makes them invincible against accountability for their crimes. Some of them have the worst possible views you've ever heard and yeah, sometimes their complaints are entirely devoid of human compassion. Like, yeah, people are gonna die. It's just terrible, but like, inevitable? I don't know, maybe I shouldn't be doing this right now. I think at a certain point, when you have everything at your fingertips, you disconnect from the rest of humanity and find yourself inconsiderate, insensitive, and at times, wholly inhuman. But still, I find it interesting, the argument that celebrities get what they deserve. When people say we shouldn't care what happens to a celebrity just because they are rich and famous, it gives me the ick. I don't have anything profound to say. I don't have some grand argument that will persuade you to understand my side. I don't think there is an argument other than the fact that celebrities are still people at the end of the day. Large swaths of them are not bigoted, are not problematic, and are not harbingers of death, and yet they too get abused by the public. In a carceral system, our only perceived hope for retribution is punishment. And oftentimes, in terms of celebrity culture, that punishment stems solely from the fact that they're highly visible. It doesn't stem from bigotry, it doesn't stem from illegal activity, 
it stems simply from being seen. That means that the abuse celebrities face isn't a flaw of the system. It doesn't just infect a few celebrities who are annoying enough or bigoted enough to warrant backlash. It affects them all. The very system that gave us celebrities and continues to uphold their legacy is abusive by nature. And that, I think, is what needs to be critiqued. If you want to hear more specific stories about celebrity mistreatment, <laughs> one of my voice crack. Broly Deschanel has an excellent video about the systemic abuse of celebrities. In it, she explores how parasocial relationships aid in the abuse of public figures and how fame is inherently contradictory. Even while celebrities receive power from their social title, the public acquires their own unique power, which they can then weaponize against celebrities sometimes to the point of fatality. My main question is why? Why is it that just because celebrities are marked by their capitalistic origins, we are unable to view them as human? What is it about capitalism and consumerism that makes us utterly incapable of seeing each other as people rather than objects? Hello. Oh my God, it's leftist icon Karl Marx, author of Das Kapital. I know him. <laughs> What's that? You're calling to tell me not to put you in my videos because I never read your work? I mean, I read the Wikipedia page about it. Isn't that enough? Well, why can other leftists get away with it and I can't? Because they actually read your work and I'm just a pop culture YouTuber? You got me there. He told me to read the Teen Vogue article about his theories instead, so... Kim Kelly, the brilliant condenser that they are, argues that the goal of capitalism is to gain. Ideally, this would be beneficial for everyone. When a business makes higher profits, they have more resources to share with their workers. This means workers get paid more, they have the ability to take off to spend with their family, and they might even have access to insurance and entertainment. <sighs> Everybody wins. <laughs> But the reality of capitalism is that the profits and resources that people receive at the top of the business rarely trickle down to those at the bottom. In actuality, those who are doing most of the labor. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog atmosphere, as Kelly explains, and this leads to a form of dehumanization, as people are forced to work much harder for less scraps. In its current form, capitalism is specifically utilized to gain at the expense of other people. This is why detractors of capitalism consider it inherently exploitative. Karl Marx argues that capitalism mutilates the laborer into a fragment of a man, degrades him to the level of an appendage of a machine, destroys every remnant of charm in his work, and turns it into hated toil. Thus, being born from a system so dehumanizing makes your own dehumanization seem normal. I don't even know why I keep saying Das Kapital like that. I just, I don't even think that's how it's said. I just want to say it so badly. <laughs> a concept that Marx heavily explores in the first volume of Das Kapital is commodity fetishism. Or so I've heard, I've never read it. Commodity fetishism isn't exactly what it sounds like. It doesn't refer to our obsession with shopping or our sexual attraction to objects. Fetishism in the sense of commodity fetishism refers to the 17th century definition, which began in West Africa. And that is an object that holds mystical or inherent power. Therefore, Marx's argument of commodity fetishism deals with the way in which we attribute mystical or inherent value or power to an object, often ignoring the productive system that gave us the object in the first place. Say you brought a shirt on Shein, Instead of knowing the conditions of the environment or who made it or how the materials for the shirt were gathered, we view it separately from human production. It's just something that spawned in your mailbox after you brought it online. It's magic. <laughs> Marx argues that commodity fetishism breaks down social relationships and replaces these relationships with objects. Instead of us having a relationship with the people who made the shirt, we just have a relationship with the shirt. And even this isn't entirely correct because it's really our money that has the first and most important connection with the shirt. Under a system that fetishizes commodities, the only relationship worth having is a relationship between objects, not people. This allows for dehumanization to flourish, especially between consumers and the products they buy. These social relations between real people at every step of the way are kept hidden from us. We know nothing about the exploited workers who produce the chair, and they know nothing about us who purchase the product of their labor for our personal use. 
Thus, the real social relations between people ourselves are hidden, and in its place we're confronted with what appears to us to be merely relations between things. Those things generally being the money in our pocket and the commodity before us, our chair. Okay, now that I have that out of the way, I have to admit something. I, your resident hot bimbo, did read something for this video, and I'm not talking about a fictional novel or even an article. I read a book on theory. The Society of the Spectacle is a 1967 critique written by Guy Debord that analyzes mass consumption and consumerist culture. As Abigail Thorne would say, this book is notoriously known for just how easy it is. I didn't even have to read 47 different articles to understand what this guy <laughs> was talking about. I also didn't have to read articles about the articles that I didn't read just to understand what was going on because it's just so damn easy. In the terms established by Guy Debord, the theory of the spectacle is a critique of late capitalist society that diagnoses a form of depoliticalization through isolation and a shift into mere role playing, as well as through the role of totalizing image based semblance. Uh, fear not everyone, I am not a witch because I don't know what the fuck that says. Commodity fetishism is at the heart of Guy Debord's critique. Debord believes that under our current model of capitalism, relationships between humans have significantly decayed. In turn, they've been replaced by spectacles, which refer to like average indicators of consumerist and capitalist culture, like advertisements, TV, and other mass media. In societies where modern conditions of production prevail, all of life presents itself as an immense accumulation of spectacles. Everything that was directly lived has moved away into a representation. The reason I'm waxing poetic about Marx and Debord is because I think their theories of capitalism and commodity fetishism help us to understand how celebrities are dehumanized. Before I go any further, it's very important to note that these theories are largely tangled in discussions of working class people, as well as impoverished people. And I'm not trying to take any of that away by using these theories in relation to celebrities. I would be taking a big fat moral L if I tried comparing someone who worries about where their next meal is coming from to someone who could end world hunger at the drop of a hat. I'm more interested in how these theories can relate to our treatment of celebrities. Because celebrities originated alongside the rise of modern capitalism and consumerism, a lot of the features inherent in those systems heavily inform how we view celebrities, that is like objects rather than people. In turn, this understanding of celebrities affects how far we're willing to go in our inhumane treatment of them. Since commodity fetishism is an appendage of capitalism and consumerism, I can see how that impacts celebrity culture as well. We view celebrities as commodities that hold inherent value and power while simultaneously concealing their human qualities, why were they doing this? So pointy. <laughs> Just like the examples given for commodity fetishism, our relationship to celebrities is one of object and object. The transaction that happens between a fan and a celebrity is almost like the transaction that happens between a consumer and a product that they buy. Because the fan is investing time, energy, and sometimes money into celebrity, they feel that they're entitled to the complexities of that person while also dehumanizing that person. The consumer believes they have an obligation to dictate the celebrity's appearance, relationships, music and lifestyle. It's like when you buy a product from a corporation and you give it a review, you say what you like about it and what you want changed about it in order to make it like the perfect product for you. In this case, we dehumanize celebrities because we view them as malleable products whose purpose of existence is to satisfy our needs as well as our desires. We are encouraged by capitalism's motto of consumption is king to constantly devour the lives and livelihood of celebrities. We are encouraged to believe by capitalism's promise that greed is good, that our constant surveillance and expectations of celebrities are warranted. And we are hypnotized into believing by capitalism's insistence of profits over people that the dehumanizing and dangerous treatment of celebrities at the hands of us and the media is fine because we get clicks, magazines get sales, and celebrities get attention and money. Debord and Marx aren't lying when they say that the relationship shared between humans has broken down since the conception of mass consumption. Life is not about being and doing or even living. It's about having 
taking, and gaining. And it's not just a poison that affects celebrities. We have a humanity problem on all fronts. And I think Mary Shelley, the great philosopher that she was, was able to explore this long before our current crisis. Frankenstein is a novel not just about a scientist pushing the boundaries of his profession or of a creature let loose on the unsuspecting country of Switzerland. It's about, as Karen Carbiner argues, humankind's own potential inhumanity to itself. The way in which we treat celebrities has become common ground for the way we treat each other especially in the age of the internet. We are highly conscious of each other's appearance and refuse to shut up about it. We mass bully, we mass manipulate, we follow and we video and we take pictures of each other without each other's consent. We cause tragedies. We exploit those tragedies. We mourn them and then we wake up and do it all over again the next day. Our ambitions have led us to the point where we too can accomplish what Victor did in his laboratory that dreary night in November. Artificially create, and perhaps take away, life. And so our monster goes forth into the confusing fray of... TikTok. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Sometimes I wonder if I'm recognizable. Like, when I'm out and about, would people be able to tell it's me? If I do away with the dramatic wigs and the jester-like costumes and just show up as myself, would people notice? Like, oh, that's, that's Shania with their significantly shorter haircut and baggy outfits they got from the local thrift. That's Shania when they're not pretending to be someone else. Sometimes I kind of dread it, like if anyone happened to see me right now in my bonnet and my basketball shorts, I would just evaporate into the air. Would they look at me differently, knowing that I'm not what I say I am on the internet? Knowing that when I get in front of them, I don't talk the way I would to my camera. This has plagued me since high school. I'm told that I'm interesting and I'm told that I'm fun, but the minute people meet me, something changes. I... I think I'm a nobody. And I don't mean that in a self-deprecating way, I mean it in a way that's like, I'm not as big as I am on screen. I'm not as poetic, I'm not as interesting. It's a kind of murder on its own. Fuck what anyone else can do to me. Pushing your real self down so far into your body that it only feels comfortable coming up for air every once in a while is a removal of life. Oftentimes, I just feel like a monster needing to be locked up for everyone else's safety. In what rough beast its hour come round at last, slouches toward Bethlehem to be born, Gates once asked. <sighs> Anyways, I'm a fraud. <laughs> I didn't think of any of that off the top of my head. I thought about it and I revised it mercilessly, and it still doesn't sound right. Does this feel like a performance? Fuck. No matter how many pauses I take in my speech in this voiceover, this is still just practiced, still performed. I want you to see an aspect of me that maybe I'm becoming afraid of, if only because it's becoming alien to me. Maybe that commenter was right. Maybe I am a product, even off camera. Something manufactured and contrived for other people to- Can you get on with the video already? When I was younger, I really wanted to be famous. I mean, I even imagined scenarios in my head of what would happen on a red carpet, where I would perform my newest albums, what I would wear to my, <laughs> well, that's not important. Being famous for me as a child growing up in poverty seemed like a magic fix, or at least a fantasy to get you through the night of hunger. When you're rich and famous, you can buy your own house, you never have to worry about food, you could shop anywhere other than the thrift stores like I did as a kid. And yeah, the tabloids would be an issue, but I didn't really care about that. 
I thought it would be fun, if nothing else, but then my frontal lobe started developing and <laughs> I realized my mistake. No one wants to be a celebrity if they already are one. Rich, maybe, but a celebrity? Not in a million fucking years. It's an ideal for us peasants, something that we conjure up to get us through the night. I mean, can you imagine never being able to go outside without having your picture taken? Can you imagine people mobbing you in airports or chasing after your car after you pull off? Can you imagine the anxiety that comes from that? It's honestly no wonder that celebrities reject that lifestyle. They refuse to perform, they hide their faces, they live in isolation. Either through a marketing scheme to seem less out of touch or a genuine desire to be human, celebrities present themselves as average. They're one of the bros. They go shopping at grocery stores, they cut their own cucumbers, they eat pizza 47 times a day, allegedly. Probably eat pizza at least once Oh, day. They're normal. I promise they're normal. I think it's us, the normal average nobodies, that like to revel in how famous we are, or at least how famous we could be if the stars align just right. And that's where social media comes in. We can be anything or anyone we want if we're the ones dictating our feeds and posts. The bizarre thing is, if you give someone the opportunity to present themselves any way they desire, they often choose the most sanitized, branded version of themselves that they can. They put on a performance because they don't think the real them is good enough. In late January, I was approached by an independent magazine called Anti-Fragile. This is not sponsored, by the way. <laughs> Anti-Fragile is just a really brilliant collective who aim to amplify marginalized voices through art. They were kind enough to feature my writing in their fourth scene issue, so if you want to check that out, it comes out May 12th. The interesting thing about their fourth issue is that it lined up perfectly with the outline I had for this video series. They wanted to explore our generation's obsession with escapism, but more specifically the intersection of social media, performance, and mass consumption. The opportunity I had to write for Anti-Fragile allowed me to explore just how dystopian celebrity culture is and how personal it's becoming for us. The line between Lady Gaga and Sally Mae who runs a TikTok account is becoming blurred. Both people manufacture images of themselves that maybe outside of the public eye they aren't consistent with. Both people are placed under extreme scrutiny by people they have never met. Both people may have fans who have parasocial relationships with them and in some cases, both people are exploited by a culture that stalks, harasses, and dehumanizes. The reason that the line between celebrity and average person is becoming so blurred is because the internet gives people the tools to blur it. Joshua Gamson calls this generation the masters of self-commodification. In that word, self-commodify, feels like an oxymoron. Humans can't be commodified because commodities are largely considered products. It's the same as Matthew Thompson's theory of human brands, but self-commodification can be understood in one of two ways. Either we form identity in relation to our consumer habits, or we rebrand ourselves using marketing strategies in an attempt to gain, whether that be money, followers, or attention. Both of these definitions are at play on social media. People who cultivate personalities based on trends or aesthetic niches may also form identities based on what they buy. There are entire tutorials and Amazon storefronts designed to get people to buy specific things in order to embody whatever niche or aesthetic personality they want to. Therefore, people like these commodified traits that form the self. Self-commodification in terms of marketing the self is also prevalent on social media among average people. As Joseph E. Davis argues, actual brands like Tommy Hilfiger transform the ways in which we market items by emphasizing the significance of images alongside them. You know when you're watching like a perfume commercial and they can't just describe the scent to you, they have to create this elaborate visual for you to understand what you're buying instead of just saying oh this perfume smells floral and woodsy perfume companies show us a very intimate video of like robert pattinson making out with someone in an elevator which is what the, the point is <laughs> you're getting an experience 
not just a product. This is kind of how average people have begun behaving on social media, almost like they're marketing themselves. They create an image that sells their audience and experience, even if they're not an influencer or celebrity. Self-branding has become the expectation for social media rather than something that someone does out of work obligation. And what's more is that the language surrounding self-commodification only quickens our descent into objectification. Quote, to self-brand, individuals must get in touch with their skills, the selling parts of their personality, and any and every accomplishment they can take credit for. Then they must consciously craft these traits into a relentlessly focused image and distinctive persona, like the Nike swoosh or Calvin Klein. Even testing their brand on the model of the marketers by using focus groups of friends and colleagues. Substance isn't nearly enough. Self-branders also need style. According to Peters, packaging counts a lot. Finally, like the famous brands that have become a part of our consciousness, self-branders have to go about enhancing their profile and increasing their visibility through marketing, marketing, marketing. Via self-promotion, they too can become objects of desire." End quote. A paragraph that sounds like it's describing a pair of jeans or perfume, but really describing someone's social media presence. Don't get me wrong, this is more nuanced than I'm letting on here. Self-commodifying is a double-edged sword. Some people don't want to, but it is necessary to grow their small business or get recognition for their passions. Shanspear didn't start as whatever it is now. <laughs> it started as me, a 21-year-old person, showing outfits in my bedroom because I felt powerless during the pandemic. Being able to create a space for myself where I could show my interests and eventually my thoughts and opinions became crucial to my health. As I started gaining a following, I felt compelled to quote unquote brand myself because that's what I was told I needed to do in order to continue building my connection um, I have with my audience. I mean, this hinders creativity in the sense that I'm striving to become an easily consumable product and not an artist. I can't just be Shakespeare. I have to make Shakespeare. Over time, that kind of got uncomfortable in of itself because people started seeing me less like a person and more like an object. And I think this has something to do also with anonymity on the internet. And that leads to comments like the one we discussed earlier. There are also people who self-commodify not because they have a small business or creative passion, but just because they just want some internet clout. They want to present a version of themselves to any given audience and they do so by creating a strict image to gain attention. I don't think this is inherently bad. Likes and follows are the social currency of our age, and I would argue that it's another human desire that we have cultivated over time. I've been on both sides of the spectrum where I have desperately wanted online attention due to my own loneliness and reality, and I've also cringed away from people who clearly want the same. It's a lot more complicated than I think I can express. Not only do we morph ourselves into products to be consumed by our audiences, we also portray this commodification as empowering. We are Victor Frankenstein in an alternate universe who looks upon his monster not in disgust, but in admiration. Technology and its media are so new that a lot of us have grown up with it and haven't had a chance to realize how destructive and dangerous it can be. Like at this point, we've come to expect constant surveillance instead of fearing it. Whether that be through apps tracking us for ad placements or us going out in public and being photographed or recorded without our consent. Most of us can't even walk across a college campus without being forced into a street interview about misogynistic hypotheticals. No, I don't want to be on your podcast, Billy. I want the government to ban microphones until we figure out what the fuck is going on. What was previously a domain specially crafted for celebrities has become the norm for the average person. If you gain enough traction on TikTok, you can find your name in a headline squeezed between articles of big names like Taylor Swift and Zendaya. This cultural transformation is something that Tiffany Ferguson brings up in her essay about Dumas and the normalization of stalking celebrities. Dumas is ironically, an anonymous Instagram account that receives and posts tips about celebrity gossip. If you see an old dude on a date with his 19-year-old girlfriend, you can snap a picture of it and send it to Dumois and go, man, I think this is Leonardo DiCaprio. And one time out of 25, 
you're probably right. This behavior is incentivized by Demois' constant validation of it. As their whole business model depends on reposting DMs, they get about celebrity sightings and gossip. But it doesn't just stop there. Tiffany points out in her video that people who wear Demois merchandise, like shirts or sweaters, can also have their picture stealthily taken without their consent almost as if they're the very celebrities that they stalk. I assume if someone is already so invested in Dumois and the politics of Dumois that they're wearing actual merchandise, they wouldn't care about being blasted in front of an audience of millions. But I do think it's still very interesting how the line between average person and celebrity gets even blurrier on social media. Celebrity culture is metamorphosing into something alien which is ironic because it already began with an air of incomprehension. Because of this shift, average people like you and me are stepping in and doing the paparazzi's job for them. And our abuse and surveillance doesn't stop with actual celebrities. We turn the camera to each other and even ourselves. We document and market and dehumanize flawlessly. As Gamson argues, the tools necessary to infiltrate celebrityhood are becoming increasingly available. Over 80% of the world's population owns a smartphone. Over 4 billion people have access to the internet across the globe. And social media apps are relatively free, unless, I don't know, you're tricked into paying $8.99 on a badge? All of this means that anyone can become highly visible depending on their charm or talent or even just algorithmic luck, which, in an ideal world would be beneficial because it means that barriers are being removed from an otherwise non-diverse Hollywood. But nothing is ideal here, so. <laughs> These technological tools afforded to us have also negatively altered us. Because anyone can become highly visible at the drop of a hat, that means that everyone has a chance to be mercilessly abused on any given platform on any given day, oftentimes for circumstances out of their control. One of the main reasons I don't post on TikTok <laughs> is because the comment sections there are a different breed. I've grown to ignore the brutality I'm faced with in my YouTube comment sections, but I would have to eradicate myself from planet Earth if I was highly visible on TikTok. From making fun of disabilities to mass harassing celebrities, influencers, and average people alike for weeks, mind you, <laughs> TikTok is a really scary place, but it's not an anomaly. Prolonged abuse happens on just about any platform that you could be highly visible upon. Twitter, Instagram, even Facebook if you're over the age of 25. This gives average people a small taste of what it's like to be a celebrity, and they find out quickly just how demoralizing it is. Our obsession with celebrities has transferred over to any highly visible person. This doesn't mean that we're no longer obsessed with celebrities, because we certainly are obsessed. <laughs> it just means that our scope of abuse has widened. Social media has made us confused about how to approach people because we don't even view them as people anymore, just fodder for our own entertainment. I don't think all of it can be explained away by capitalism or consumerism, but I do think there's a pertinent connection. Just like celebrities, we've begun viewing everyone we've ever come in contact with as products. It's like we're suffering in mass from main character syndrome. We think people are specially crafted for us, and when they don't check all of our boxes, we declare that there's some sort of defect. There's something inherently wrong with them. We do this in the same way that we would consider a broken bicycle or a buggy phone defective. We look these people in the eye and say, you're selling us a product. And what we really mean by that is that you're selling yourself. We want people to produce the sort of existence that we want from them and accept our abuse willingly. That's our right as consumers, after all. Through the creation of our social media monsters, we've begun to internalize the idea that if it's not on camera, if it's not being marketed or branded perfectly, then it's not worth existing. The end result has created an almost awkward, unsettling image of the human race. We've created people who don't allow themselves to show genuine vulnerability out of fear of being criticized. We've created people who do show vulnerability, but it comes off as uncomfortable and performed. There's people who only show the most perfect corners of their houses, of their shopping lists, of their bodies. People who forget that 
reality even exists. The spectacle is not a supplement to the real world, Debord argues, nor is it an additional decoration. It is the heart of the unrealism of the real society. I think if I had to visualize it, I would imagine our current culture as a large aisle in a department store. There's row after row of boxes, and within these boxes are us. We're perfectly polished Barbie dolls who have forgotten the importance of ugliness. Ugliness and healthy community and privacy are pertinent to the health of the human race. Without it, we're sick. We do things that hurt other people. We do things that hurt ourselves. We reject a life that's actually worth living because we've deluded ourselves into believing that the unwatched life is meaningless. We miss out on the ability to exist and not care or know what we look like in that moment. The ability to experience something and not think about relaying it to large unknown audiences. The ability to be a person and not a manufactured image. There's an interesting quote in Amy Henderson's essay, which reads, What if the camera lies? What if, as Borstein argued in the image, media created pseudo events only blurred the distinction between fact and fiction? Are we then left in this image dominated culture to a world that is itself but a giant simulation of reality? Are we doomed to a reality of fake existence? doomed to give birth to different, horrible, altered versions of ourselves just so we can appear perfect on social media? I wonder what we're running from when we do this. What are we running to? <laughs> Bestie girl, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't have the answer for you. I wish I did. I wish I was smart enough to crack this code, but something about this conversation feels endless, you know? A part of me wants to say that this isn't as bad as it sounds, our metamorphosis into celebrities and products may be overstated, but another part of me is afraid of what this means for our culture's ability to understand each other and to connect outside of the spectacle. Debord argues that the spectacle expects you to endure with passive silence. It tells you that its existence is good, that by its nature, it's not capable of showing you anything bad. That makes critiquing it so much harder. It's almost Orwellian, right? But what else can we do except let our mangled progeny go forth and wreak havoc? Let me know what you guys think about this topic in the comment section below. Special points to whoever watched the whole video before sharing their thoughts. I can always tell. <laughs> the only way for us to have a fair conversation is if you listen to what I have to say, maybe a few times for it to really stick. And please remember that I and everyone else in the comments section share this earth with you. We are people, no matter what the furry profile pictures of some of the people in the comment sections imply. And I will see you sometime, someplace else, doing something insufferable. <laughs> Bye. I love you. Take care.